Hello, everyone. Hey, this is Dan Bova at entrepreneur.com. Thanks to everyone who is logging in. Great to see you. We already see everyone's firing away in the chat already. This is great. As always, we have the man, Mark. Randolph. <laughs> I had a weird little I forgot your name there for a second. Mark. Got my Randolph. last name, I know. Uh, good to see you. Uh, Frank. Dan. Dan. Dan Frank, yeah. So Mark Randolph, the uh one of the founders of Netflix and the former CEO of said company. He is here to answer all your questions about starting a small business, running it. Anything you want to ask him, this man has yet to be stumped on the show. I'm easily stumped, as you just witnessed. Uh, love to see the comments already. We got some love for Mark's podcast. That will never work. If you haven't checked it out, you should check it out. So, Mark, are you ready to go? I'm as ready as I'm going to be, damned. And I'm, I'm not so sure how I feel about asking people to try and stump me, but okay. <laughs> not the point. <laughs> So one thing I want to note, uh, so Mark did work at uh, Netflix. He, in fact, was a co-founder of it. He doesn't currently work there. So a lot of people will ask questions about pitching their movie idea. I mean, you could ask. Maybe he's looking for it, but I don't think he is. I also don't think he's going to be able to help you with your password reset. But uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe you can, Mark. I don't, I'm not sure. If I don't know it, I'll make it up. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's get to some real questions. Um, let's see. Who do we got here? All right. Let's start with uh, Kathy Wisewa, who says um, she's got traffic going to her site with free content. But the problem is she finds that people are consuming the free content and then they're not buying anything and they're just leaving. So uh, she wants to know if you have any advice for converting people to stay and actually buy something. Yeah, it's a it's such an interesting dynamic. Um, I'm I'm a huge fan of that freemium model, where basically you give away something for free, use that to attract traffic, and then figure out some way to say, is there a small percentage of people who are willing to pay for a subset of it? And the the, the quick answer is there is no single way to do that. And I won't sugarcoat it. It's difficult. It's not difficult to do it. It's difficult to figure out what is the right way to parse apart what you're doing and figure out how to put some side of it in the pay side and some side of it on the free side. And people who are in the subscription product business spend a huge amount of time and effort on coming up with those differentiators. And one great place to start is basically to go and do a tour of every single uh, consumer subscription software product you're familiar with and look at how they do it. And they're really smart about it. They go, here's the free one. It's limited to X. Uh, but if you pay for this tier, you get YZ. And if you go to this tier, you get these other features. And then there's a fourth tier usually, which says call us for pricing. Obviously, for what sounds like a content site, you don't need to be that sophisticated. But there are certain things you can do to split apart um, the paid from the free. Um, one classic one is to do extended. So, for example, I don't, and again, it's hard without knowing in detail what your content is. But you can say, for example, these clips, these short clips are free. But if you want to see what happened next, you'll find that behind the paywall. Uh, another one is to do recency, which is uh, my subscribers get access to this information sooner than everybody else. So if you want to be the first person to see it, then you should be on the subscribing side. The last one, not the last one, a third one, of course, is um, not sure what the, can't come, come up with the word right now, but basically saying that there is a lot of content here, which is even better, which is not on the free side, which is on the pay side. Um, and I think you have to experiment with creating these two differentiators between here's the free side, here's what anyone could come and get for free, and have that be interesting and attractive enough that you can generate lots of volume 
and then have something compelling, obviously, on the other side. And you're only going to find that by experimenting. I will give you one warning, though, which is I think a lot of people are so eager to generate something which makes sense on the pay side that they put everything on the pay side or put everything good on the pay side. And that's part of this balancing act that I'm talking about as well. You are better off having something where 95% of the content is free and 5% is paid and having 100 times the volume than you are having it be 50-50 and having very, very little volume. So if you're going to err, I would err, 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 err. I would make an error on the um, giving more away free and experimenting with what you can do on the pay side. Another great example, of course, is newsletters. So lots and lots of else people doing exactly what you're trying to do. And the fact that you haven't found it yet does not mean it's not possible. It just means you haven't stumbled on the right formula for how to differentiate your two, uh, what goes on each side of your paywall. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so this is an interesting question and, uh, you know, it, it's come up in various forms I'm seeing in the chat here, but this was submitted earlier. Um, she, uh, this, a reader says I've identified a problem in the market, but people aren't buying my solution. How do I convince people that this will make their life easier? Like you find a problem, but no one else thinks it's a problem or it's not a big enough problem for them. So how do you say, hey, seriously, this is going to make your life easier? Yeah, it, 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 I'm suspicious because what this sounds like is that classic uh, entrepreneurial error. I'm sorry, I'll call it that, where basically uh, you've got a solution and you're now in search of a problem. Uh, and th that's the quick thing here is to say, if people aren't buying my solution, you shouldn't be blaming the people. <laughs> you should be blaming yourself. It's the wrong solution, or it's not really a problem. Um, if you've identified a problem in the market to start, that's fantastic. That is the mother of all uh, great innovations. Um, and what you have to do is say, let's try some different solutions and keep on throwing solutions until you find one that actually does solve the problem. Again, not a lot of information to go on here, but my suspicion is that you're in love with your solution. And uh, that's not the way to approach it. As uh, my friend Ari Levine says, you should not fall in love with the, uh, with the solution. You should fall in love with the problem. And um, that's, I suspect, what's, uh, what's going on here. Uh, don't just try and market harder. Don't just try and convince harder. Basically, if this really is a great solution, um, it should sell itself. So what if uh, you are hosting a show and in the middle of saying the guest's name, your mind goes completely blank? Is, that a solu <laughs> is there a solution you have for that? <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure, but it's definitely a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right. Let's see what we got in the chat here. A lot of questions about esports. Have you uh, delved into that world at all? Do you have any thoughts on how, I mean, the category is obviously ex uh, continues to explode, but what, what are you seeing? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm not sure. Oh, the question is simply if I have interest in esports. And I'm going to have to confess, well, there's two different dimensions to it. Uh, as a user, no. Uh, and maybe that's just my, uh, my demographic, if I can put that politely. Um, but it could also be my personal interest. I'm just not a spend a lot of time in front of a screen guy. And I'm not, there's no, uh, I'm not casting aspersions. There's no value judgment here. Just doesn't do much for me. I mean, I've certainly lurked uh, over my son's shoulder while he's playing, uh, you know, Fortnite and while he's playing uh, all the other, uh, you know, multiplayer uh, virtual virtual environment games. But I'm not big into it myself. But I think it's one of the big mistakes for people of my generation or any generation to write that off because it certainly is um, highly competitive. It certainly is highly attractive. What I like about it is the very nature of it being virtual, being an e-business, is that it transcends the 
other restrictions that are inherent in physical sports, which is everyone has to be in the same place. It's limited. I mean, these platforms are virtually unlimited, and I'm definitely a big fan of scalable um, solutions. And esports is highly scalable. And what is especially interesting to me, which I probably never saw coming, is the interest in watching other people play esports. You know, and using Twitch and using um, actually having huge arenas where people pay money to sit in a seat and watch people play live. Um, that I didn't really anticipate. Certainly it's a big category. And I think there's all kinds of interesting things that are continue to happen as esports collides with other innovations like AI and collides with um, blockchain. Um, I think you're going to see a lot of interesting things coming there. So certainly a really, really interesting category to watch if not to play. Um, How about well, you, Dan? What, what's your, what's your, I, I picture you as being a, uh, grand theft auto kind of guy. <laughs> In real life, yes, absolutely. Um, <laughs> well, speaking of being in the great outdoors, uh, I'm not sure if you're near uh, Santa Cruz, but uh, but uh, one of our viewers, Corey, says the swell is up in Santa Cruz. So um, <laughs> thanks for that. Well, tip I'm in an undisclosed location, so I. Uh, but the funny, you know, I, listen, it's no secret. I <clears throat> I spend a bunch of time in Santa Cruz. But I, I've I've turned into a, a fairly fair weather surfer these days, in that uh, despite the quality of the swell, my friend, uh, the water is still effing freezing, uh, <laughs> and it's probably crowded. Uh, and the older I get, the less interesting those things. The, le the less, more there. Right these days, my vibe is waves fifty percent, crowd quality. 100%. That's what I go for these days. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so riding the wave, let's go with that. Um, uh, we have uh, Linda Peck wrote in, she said, I've worked for some of the largest companies in the world, yet I'm still challenged to have steady coaching work. Um, so she wants to know, how do I market my brand to increase visibility? But I guess the bigger question is, how do you build momentum? Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, and I, nothing, I, I don't have a quick, yeah, let me think for a second. How do I market my brand to increase? Okay, I got one for you. Um, so without saying what kind of coaching work you do, um, and I, you probably do this, but in my opinion, probably the most effective way to generate this, well, there's two ways, but the most effective way is thought leadership. Uh, if you are not already extremely active as a trying to become a thought leader in your space, you almost can't ever invest too much in that category. And uh, it's very similar to the very, very first question we talked about, which is that free and paid, is that you have your paid work where you go in and you work coaching people in large, some of the largest companies in the world. But do you have a free side? And I would highly encourage you to begin developing a free side. And what you need to do then is build this hierarchy between the free side and the pay side. So it's not just, hey, I tweet, and then I charge uh, $10,000 a day or $100,000 a day, whatever you charge. What you want to do is build this continuum between the two. So absolutely, you should be putting content out. You should be writing on LinkedIn. You should be writing on Medium. You should have a blog. You should have an email list. You should have Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, all the stuff where you're putting out all this value you give to corporations, you are giving it away free. And it's exactly the right thing. Maybe you give away right now, you have a certain number of clients, but you'll be giving it away to a, hundred, a thousand times more people, but you'll see you'll get way more of the people willing to pay, but you have to build the bridge between them. So for example, it might make sense to go, I have all this free content. And then I also have a newsletter and I use Substack for it. And that one, my subscribers pay a hundred dollars a month and they get longer content, quicker content, better content. Then I have a tier where people pay a thousand dollars a month. And for them, I don't appear in person, but I will answer emails. I'll get on chat. We'll do occasional meetups, virtual meetups. 
Um, and then maybe you have something where you go, now I'm going to charge uh, $10,000 a month and we're going to meet in large groups once a month. But what happens is you're building the classic funnel where at the top you have eventually, optimistically, a million followers who are consuming free content. And then you have 10,000 people who are buying the $100 a month. And then you have, I don't know, I can't do the math here, 1,000 people, 500 people who are buying the you know 1,000 a month. And then you narrows down and you have 20 or 20 who are doing this. And eventually out of them come the people who are willing to pay your day rate and have you come personally and work with them. So I guess that was a long way of saying the answer is build a funnel. Excellent. Uh, and uh, well, looking here at something, something just popped up that was uh, interesting. I'm, I'm wondering about your let, thoughts here. Let, so, let me back up. Let me back up for a second, Dan. I'm sorry yeah. to cut you off. Hold that thought. You, I want to give you, I mean, that last question was such a good one. Uh, I want to give a quick example of it. Uh, and I can, I think this may be one of the very first episodes of the podcast I did back when I was in this mode of, trying to uh, figure out whether this podcasting was going to work. And one of the people I had on was a woman who for many, many years um, had uh, been a pickup artist coach, you know, teaching men how to pick up women. And for understandable reasons, after not too long, began to realize this is awful what I am teaching people how to do and realized that the skills that she was teaching people to do could be applied, not just for picking someone up, but for actually establishing connection with people, uh, finding friends, intimacy, all those sort of things. And so she got into this coaching business and like you had a handful of very high end clients who would pay her for pay her for that. And she went out and then built exactly what I'm talking about building. She started off by writing about it doing public relations appearances, make, getting it to the point where every time any kind of TV show, a new show is having some segment about people being distant from each other, that she'd go on as a guest to talk about how, tips you could use to become more accessible and outgoing. Converted that to these small groups, which were very inexpensive, that were online, then to group meetings. So she did exactly all those things I was talking about very successfully. And what it did, besides giving her this income stream from the high, um, high volume stuff, but dramatically increased the flow of people who are willing to pay for the one-on-one -on -one sessions. Uh, it totally worked just the way I hoped it would. And I, I'm sure that you can make that work for yourself too. All right. Sorry, Dan. Just had to get that in because I realized, oh my God, I, I'm not just pontificating about this. I've actually <laughs> seen it work. No, that's great. And, and to, to add to that, you know, um, as, as a means of getting your name out there, you know, there's websites like entrepreneur.com where you could become, uh, you know, a contributor there. There's also a site called help a reporter out where you could list yourself as an expert that reporters, I need an expert on such and such topic and, and you get listed and you get an email. Um, so there's a lot of ways uh, if, if you're someone that has a lot of information, a lot of value to give uh, a lot of ways to get your name out there. So, uh, I think that's, that's good stuff. So, um, I'm trying to find, oh, there we go. Uh, this was from, uh, Angus Watt, who's, uh, watching right now. So thanks for your question, Angus. Um, he's wondering, so as one of, one of the guys who helped kill Blockbuster, Mark, um, oh, what do you mean him? No, no, no. Um, what, uh, what are, when you look at the current landscape of things, do you see any big name things that people can't believe will one day be totally irrelevant? Is there anything <laughs> that you see, uh, about to tumble? Oh my gosh. It's countless. Yeah. Okay. I mean, no, I'm serious. Yeah. Uh, Here's an interesting exercise for you. You know, go back and Google, I don't know, Google Fortune 500, uh, 1970 or, you know, 1960, 70 is good, 50 years ago. So Google that. And those were the biggest 500 companies in the world. Uh, and it's amazing how few of them are still there. And now look at today's list and see how different it is. And I, it's an interesting thing to do because almost instantly you'll get this sense of how quickly the world changes and how back, if you would ask people in 1970, what's the likelihood that a Polaroid is not going to be around or, or Xerox or I mean, no one would believe you. 
these were the dominant companies. And hey, you know, it's so easy to stumble and fall behind. In fact, it is the nature of, um, of progress that it usually is not driven by the leading companies. It's driven by leading companies being unwilling or, um, or scared or unable to embrace what current customers want and leaving room for all the small companies like us to go at, go and get them. Um, but listen, I'll give you a couple examples. Look at the front. I mean, have you, uh, have you bought a car lately? Uh, what a ridiculous, I mean, with small exceptions, what a ridiculous process that is of how you buy a car or you want an even worse example, buy a house. Uh, and you know, in, in the state of California where I live, <laughs> it's reasonably simpler and that you don't need a lawyer, but back in New York where I used to live, it's incredibly complicated. Look how much paper is developed. Look at that thing you've got to sign. It's a, literally 150 pages, the title company. It's a mess. Look at look at some of the things that are going on in pharma right now. How you go, you go to the doctor's office, right? And you were there what eighteen months ago? Uh, can you please sit down in the chair and fill out this five page form on paper with a pen on a clipboard? Well, I just did it, but I know we need it all again. And then you go down the right down the around the corner to the other doctor. Can you please fill out all this stuff on a clipboard? If you don't think that stuff's broken. Everything is broken and everything's in the process of being disrupted. Now, there's reasons why these things are still there. Um, and it's simply because there's a lot of inertia uh, or they're being protected by legal barriers. Um, and but those things eventually crumble under the pressure of consumer expectation and consumer demand. I did some events for, uh, I did one for, well, I won't say any of the names, two large car companies recently. And one of them, you know, and they're, they're, they still have all this infrastructure designed to serve, uh, cars that use gasoline. Now, if you don't think that is all going to change, what I'm not, is it going to change next year? Of course not. Is it going to change in 10 years? No, but is it going to change in a 500 years? Yes. So now we know it's going to change. So now I'll draw the line backwards. It's exactly the same thing that happened with Blockbuster. I mean, at the time, in 1997, Blockbuster had 9,000 stores. They had 60,000 employees. They were a $6 billion business. And you could see clearly that it was coming. I mean, there was digital content. It was the DVD. Now, how many DVD players were there? This many. How many people were streaming video? Zero. So, hey, that this year looks pretty good. Now, next year, how many DVD players are there? There's this many. How many streaming videos are there? Well, this many. Oh, we can wait. You wait and wait and wait and wait. And the world changes eventually. Everything's like that. So sorry, you got me fired up here. There are so many opportunities. And what happens is technologies come along that don't just accelerate this, that dramatically make them shift. And one was once media went digital. Yes, that just said it's inevitable now that the existing platforms for content distribution are going to die. As soon as the electric automobile with batter, had battery pat life and other innovations to allow it to be more than a novelty, that signed the death certificate for the service station. Not now, some years in the future. This blockchain comes along. That has signed the death certificate for the existing way of buying and selling houses and buying and selling cars. Not now, at some point in the future. In other words, all kinds of amazing opportunities out there if you are clever and patient. Man, you 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 triggered me, man. I, I've uh, just very recently been dealing with a wonderful car company, uh, and I was <laughs> just like, "How is this so hard?" <laughs> well, because we've got to sit you down in that little office for yeah. an hour and a half and wear you down so you buy the extended warranty or the undercoating. Unbelievable. Because, oh, oh, is that good for the customer? Oh, no, no, no. But our whole margin structure depends on screwing people over. Yes. And so, uh, <laughs> of course, we have to until, I mean, look, look at, I, I don't know if, I, I mean, I, you, I don't know how many Teslas you've bought, Dan, probably a bunch. I lost count, but, but yeah. Besides the innovation of just uh, uh, the electricity aspect of it, just being able to go to a website, you pick your features, you click buy. And then they say, okay, we'll deliver it to you or you'll pick it up. And it's still flawed in a bunch of ways, but oh my God, what a, forget how great the car might be. Just buying it uh, made me feel great. 
Well, that's a, you know, a question about that, uh, off of that. Is- and then some states go, I'm sorry, you can't buy a car unless they have a dealer. Oh, right. well, what a great way to make things better for our citizens. <laughs> It's but wait, the, governor, those those things don't they those, that, that doesn't make things better for the citizens. But oh no, I know. But they make it. Uh, the, the citizens aren't contributing to my campaign. The car, car dealerships are. I'm sorry. Talk about triggered. Yeah. yeah. Talk about all the stupid. <laughs> but all this stupid stuff is frustrating for us as consumers. But oh my God, is it? It's what makes the fact that we're all entrepreneurs so exciting limitless opportunities to take advantage of people's stubbornness and misaligned incentives. Well, thank you. I, I forget who asked that question, but that was a good one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Talk about triggered. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, uh, on that question of, of car prices and you never knowing uh, you go in, that's the sticker price, but that's not really the price we're going to wheel and deal. You always, you can't walk out of that place without feeling like you got ripped off, that you could have got a better price. Um, what do you think about, though, you know, giving, you know, special deals to people to, to entice them? You know, how do you navigate that so that people know they're getting a good deal and don't think that they're getting ripped off? If that's a good question. It's not a good question. <laughs> I mean, it's um, no, it's it's I understand exactly what you mean, though. But it, it comes down to a deeper thing. S- jumping back to this question about all these entrenched companies that were used to be on the Fortune 500 uh, 50 years ago and are no longer there, it's not because they're stupid. It's because you get locked in to an existing business model. And you don't have the courage to change it when you recognize that this business model no longer suits what customers actually want. And like I said, the reason that they have this price negotiation thing going on at the dealer is not because anybody in their infinite wisdom has said, this is the best way for a consumer to buy a car. It's because that's how the dealerships make money and their margins are so low and they're all selling commodities and you can go right down the block, right down to the town next over and you get the exact same car. It's all messed up. Um, and so what you have to do, let's now shift gears and say, let's say you're one of these big companies. It is tremendously terrifying to say, I can clearly see what we have to do to serve the customer best, but that is going to completely mess with our business model. And this problem is dramatic no matter what happens, but it is a hundred X if you're a public company and you have to report your earnings every three months. And when you say, oh, my gosh, if we're really going to do what customers would serve customers best in this environment, in this situation, it's going to take a complete retooling. We're going to have to deal with a totally different margin structure, a totally different sales and support model. It's going to trash our earnings for a couple of years. Well, well, every CEO knows that that just means they're going to get totally trashed. The stock's going to tank and they're going to lose their job. And so I'll let someone else deal with it. Having the courage to do what a customer wants today and not do what your business model demands is the key to that. So how do you navigate special deals? You have the courage to not do them unless that is, for some reason, what makes the most sense for the consumer. Consumer will always tell you what they want. And if you're not willing or unable or scared to give it to them, there's plenty of other companies um, who will. It might take them a while. but it's it's an unsustainable long term model, you know. And I've talked before about the, using Netflix as an example. You know, at the very beginning, day one, we sold DVDs and rented DVDs, and uh, mostly sold them. Ninety nine percent of the revenue, and that was an unsustainable model. So we had to basically have the courage to walk away from that entirely and bet everything on the one that worked. And every instance you say, I'm going to walk away from a model which is broken, despite the fact that it's paying the bills, despite the fact that I've built all this infrastructure to support it. That's my problem. That's not the customer's problem. Mark, I think you must look hungry because there's a lot of offers to buy you lunch in this chat. Um, so um, <laughs> I'm looking a little malnourished. <laughs> I'll get you some chicken soup, Boobla. <laughs> 
lot of people want to to pick your brain and and buy you a cup of coffee. Uh, I'm sure that happens a lot. But um, so my question to you, based on some stuff we've been seeing in the news uh, in Russia. Now we're not going to talk about pol- global politics, but internal politics. In Russia, we see this this coup that came and went, but maybe it's coming back, and who knows where it's going to go. But my question to you is: Have you been on either side of an internal coup at at a place of work, and how did you manage that when you when you feel forces gathering against you, or when you are with like minded employees, or like this guy who's running things doesn't know what he's doing? We got to make this better. Wow. <laughs> I would love to have a cup of coffee with that person because there is something going on in that person's life, which is uh, hugely stressful right now. It's kind of the subtext there is my boss is a jackass uh, and is driving this company into the ground. What do we do about it? <laughs> so the answer is I've never had, to my knowledge, a revolt in the ranks. And, and, but that's, uh, maybe that's partly luck. Uh, uh, and maybe there was a lot of stuff brewing I didn't know about. But um, I will instead take the positive spin and think it's because I one of the cultural aspects of the companies that I've started and have run is this um, I, you know, radical honesty. And it gets talked about in Netflix context, but it's not something we invented or came up with as being a great idea. It's just the way that I've always been. I've always said what I think. I've always been very comfortable delivering bad news and all that, all those things. And so there has never been this sense of here's what we're doing and I don't care what you think. And I tend to suspect that it's the here's what we're doing and I don't care what you think. That is what creates those problems. That if people are willing to listen and understand and you don't need to do what somebody says, but you have to recognize that maybe there is um, value in what they're saying and take it seriously and visibly take it seriously and respond and say, I hear you. What I think I hear you saying is that this decision to walk away entirely from selling direct and go entirely to the channel or vice versa is ridiculous that it's going to kill the company. Here, I, is that what I, hear, I hear you correctly? Here's why I don't think that's the case. And here's why I've just made a decision we're going to do this. I'm not saying the person will be happy. I'm not saying um, they're not going to want say, I, I don't want to be in this company anymore. But they will feel heard. Um, and they will say, this is not boneheaded obstinance. This is just difference of opinion. Um, and that that's the nature of it. And part of the job of a CEO is you've got to make hard decisions. Almost nothing you decide will every single person agree with. Um, and the trick to doing that comfortably is not being a dictator, uh, is not surrounding yourself with cronies and seeing the world only through their eyes. It's genuinely making sure you understand all the perspectives in the room um, and then making a decision. Uh, and you're right all the time. No, but someone has to it falls to you. And hopefully that doesn't cause, um, any, uh, palace coups. Uh, and you have, hopefully you won't ever find your own head on a spike <laughs> or paraded to the streets of the town, you know, shame, shame, right, right, right. right. <laughs> to draw from another imagery. Um, so we're do- a couple more questions here. We'll try to get to you a couple more before we wrap this up. Thanks to everyone again for, for sticking with us for all your great questions. Um, R. Nelson wonders your thoughts on work from home. Is it killing creativity and productivity? Should people be back in an office or what, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, what a great question. And boy, we are right at the right time to be having that discussion. Cause I don't know about you, Dan, do you feel the tide is changing a little bit? Do you, do you feel this kind of start to push back about, hey, maybe this work from home thing isn't everything it was cracked up to be? Yeah. And what's interesting is we're hearing it now, not just from CEOs and bosses who perhaps were a little bit 
earlier to go, oh gosh, this isn't quite as productive. We're hearing it from employees too, who are kind of going, yeah, it was really fun. It's a novelty to be working from home, but I'm kind of, I kind of miss that. And I have all these new colleagues who I work with every day. I've never actually met or see what they eat right. or uh, going out to have a, a drink with them after work or all the things which, at least for people of your and my generation, form these fundamental things which become long-term work, great, better working relationships, in my opinion, and yeah. in many cases, long-term friendships. So I think all of us are starting to recognize that there's something missing um, from with work at home. Uh, as with most things, there's a balance. Um, some jobs, quite frankly, not only don't depend on person to person, but do better without person to person. I mean, certainly, you know, when we've set up at Looker, uh, when we were setting up um, our office design, you go, no, we're going to have basically salespeople. We're going to have marketing people. We're going to have most support people. Like, I mean, an open, so open office plans. They overhear each other and they serve, they, uh, not surreptitiously, they uh, coincidentally bump into each other. But the engineers, no, they, they're in their own offices with a door they can close because it takes so long to become immersed in the problem that once you break that flow, you've destroyed productivity. And they don't benefit that much from someone walking by and saying, did you hear what's happening with this customer? Um, so there are certainly some jobs which will benefit long term. And one of the benefits of remote work for jobs like that is it dramatically expands the talent pool. Because it is such a big mistake to think that the only, for example, great engineers are located in Silicon Valley, no longer the case, and they're very expensive. There's amazing stuff happening all over the world, and remote work opens that up. But I think as a generality, and do not nail me on this one, I think that having in person or largely in person or maybe even to some degree in person is a very, very positive thing. And again, my own internal personal biases, and again, it could be my age and the way I've worked, is that I really need in person because so much of what goes into making a decision, so much of what goes into salesmanship, so much of what goes into leadership is way beyond words. It's not what happens in a text message or an email um, or a, um, you know, a, a, a the chat group. Um, it's watching somebody. It's seeing how they respond. Uh, I see your mouth saying yes, but I see everything else in your body saying no. And without getting those clues, I personally think um, something is lost. Doing closings, uh, trying to convince someone of something on Zoom, you risk these huge false positives. Um, you don't recognize there's something not quite going right that you can address or figure out what the problem is or what can I, how can we restructure this to work for you? You hang up thinking you have it done and it turns out you're not even close. So Dan, I, I'll put me down on the side of let's all go back to work. All right. All right. Uh, I'm not going to lie. There's some disagreement in the chat with your stance, but you know, that's what we're here for. Um, I would say, uh, you know, uh, the hybrid thing makes a lot of sense to me. Some days it's good for you to be home, go see your kid's game or something like that. And some days I got to get the hell away from my kid so I can concentrate on something. So um, I, I see the benefits of both. It, absolutely. And, and it's the danger of painting it as black and white because it's an extremely nuanced subject. Because, for example, you know, if you, you can lump all kinds of stuff into going back to work, which is you have to be here certain hours and you be called on any day and night and you've got to work. Real, it doesn't have to be like that. I mean, that, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into what creates a great work-life balance. And yes, if you work at a company which doesn't give a shit about work-life balance, working from home is great. <laughs> and in fact, it <laughs> keeps your sanity. Right. My point is, there's benefits. Both of those things, I think, can happen simultaneously. So I hope that's not a red herring for saying, if you go to work, you have no life. If you right. go to the office, you have no life. Right. Because I don't think that's, I think that's a false correlation. Right, right. Great, great. Well, um, uh, you know, we, we, we got, we got a lot out of you today, Mark. So I'm gonna, mm -hmm. I'm gonna close the question bag up. 
But um, one question that a lot of people ask, and I don't know if this is a short answer to this, but everyone wants to know, what's what's Mark Randolph excited to do next? Is there a big project for you? Is there a big talk coming up? They want to know what you're, what you're uh, jazzed about right now. And I'm, I'm debating whether I can talk about it. Um, we, we, we all promise we won't say a word. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be surprising. So, but it's not surprising. I'll, I'll mention it. I'll mention it here because we're among friends. So, one of the someone answered asked that question earlier about how do I, I work one on one with all these large corporations, and uh, how do I expand that? And I was saying you 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 basically become a thought leader, but you then build everything in between. And I have that same continuum going. So I do uh, you know at one end I work with four or five small companies entrepreneurs, and I work very closely with them as a mentor and a coach meeting with them quite frequently. And I invest the time to know their category and their company and their products, and their co-founders. And, but I, because that's so time intensive, I can only do a handful of people. And at the other end, I have, um, I have the speeches I do. I have the book that I wrote. I have the podcast. I have my tweets and TikToks, which can reach many, many, many more people. So what I'm trying to do is figure out what's in the middle. How do you interact with people and be truly helpful at scale? And so one of the things that I've done is I, uh, we're still on the experimental stages, but I built a, a um, uh, online entrepreneurship community, small, um, where I, my model is that people can help each other. Uh, and it's one of the reasons that I'm so aligned with what entrepreneur does, because I know you have exactly the same motivations is creating these communities of people who can all help each other. Uh, I'm trying a slightly different way to do that. I'm doing it on discord. Uh, it's invitation only now, but it's, um, it's really, really fun and interesting. Cause I feel like I'm doing a startup again. Um, I have a bunch of people who are helping do it, who are coming from that community um, it's cool. So I will just mention since this, this is a reasonably intimate group that, that if people are interested in joining the community, they can come to my website, the markrandolph.com. There it is on the screen and there's a way to apply. We don't let everybody in, but, um, uh, that's my current project. So wow. thank you, Dan, for giving me the opportunity. That's to pretty cool. That's pretty talk cool. at it. And thank you for whoever asked that question, because I think I, it is something I think about, um, a lot and, it's funny how it's kind of reawake. Not, I had said to myself when I finished Looker, never again. I do not want to start. It's too much. But building this community called Neverland, by the way, based on you know, whatever. Yeah, that will never work, which everyone hears. It's Neverland. It's to remind us all. That's what everyone gets told. Um, but doing that just has rekindled how exciting it is trying things, seeing them not work, trying new things, trying to figure out how to solve problems. You know? Yeah. That's awesome. Always man. need to scratch that itch. That's the thing, Dan. That's so great. You know, I'm looking around my desk for one of those invites. I don't see one, but um, you know, maybe I'll get invited to be. Uh, it must have gotten. It must have gotten lost. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what happened. <laughs> well, Check your spam folder. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mark, that sounds awesome, and it's so in line with everything you've done and and art continue to do. So. On behalf of everyone in this chat room, thank you again for taking the time to share your insights here. Thank you for everyone who showed up here. And I want to encourage everyone to check out Mark's podcast, That Will Never Work, his book, That Will Never Work, and the new season of Elevator Pitch. Mark, you're, you're on fire on this on this season, man. It's it's awesome. There, there's some yeah. great stuff going on. So I the, other, uh, the one today? Featuring CeeLo Green as one of the uh, as one of our guest uh, investors. So check yeah. it out. Really, really fun. Great. He's amazing. Stuff. All right. Well, we will see you all again. We're gonna we're gonna take a, a little summer break. Uh, go catch those uncrowded waves, and then we will uh, <laughs> see you all back in the fall. So have a great summer, everyone, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, everybody.